Again, let me welcome everybody. Welcome to the Future Trends Forum. I'm glad to see you here today. We have a couple of terrific guests talking about an extremely important subject, and I'm really looking forward to our conversation. Uh, every campus has some kind of office or team or function focused on enrollment management, trying to bring in the best, most appropriate students in a way that fulfills the college's mission or also keeps the university's books balanced. This is a whole professional field now, institutionalized and elaborate, and there's a lot of questions about how it works. This week's guests are really critical of enrollment management. They have recently published uh, an important new book. And if you'd like to, if you look in the bottom left corner of the screen, you should see a button that says lifting the veil on enrollment management, which will tell you all kinds. Of, I'll take you to the website so you can grab a copy and I'll share a discount link in the chat in just a couple of minutes. But what is enrollment management doing these days? What's it doing wrong? Is it actually countervailing the uh, social justice possibilities of higher education? Well, in order to examine that, let me bring up our guests. So first of all, I'd like to uh, have uh, from New America, Stephen Bird. And Stephen, hello, sir. Greetings. Hi, how are you? Thank you so much for having me. Oh, we're delighted to have I'm you. I'm excited to be on the stage. I didn't know how I would get up here. And, and now you are. <laughs> yes. Well, Stephen, geographically, where are you? Uh, I'm in Washington. Well, I'm in Silver Spring, Maryland, but uh, oh. my office is in Washington. I just drove through Silver Spring uh, yesterday, actually. I, had yeah. I, I wish I, I should stop by just to get out of traffic. <laughs> uh, Stephen, we have a we have a tradition on the forum of asking people to introduce themselves by looking to their own future, uh, so not their own past. What are you going to be working on for the next year? What are the big ideas and the big projects for you? Well, so I am I'm following up uh, on the book. So the book is Lifting the Veil on Enrollment Management, how um, uh, a powerful industry is limiting social mobility in American higher education. I'm following up on the book, um, looking at uh, possible solutions. We have in the book a number of solutions that were offered. And I've put together an expert panel um, of higher education experts to help me figure out which of the proposals in the books have legs, uh, whether there are other proposals to consider. Um, so I'm hoping that we can start to uh, get a little bit more specific about what to, uh, where we want things to go. Um, and as a writer, uh, I'm, I was a journalist at uh, the Chronicle, Chronicle of Higher Education before coming to New America. Um, I'm much better at, you know, I'm much better at pointing out problems than coming up with solutions. Ah. So that's why I need my expert panel, but we've been, uh, we've been working on it. Oh, very good. Very good. And, yeah. and you've done multi-volume uh, books before, right? Uh, uh, have I done any other book? This is my first book, Oh, I uh, but I've done, uh, you know, a number of, of uh, magazine articles and other kind. And I was, I was a, I was a journalist for a long time. So you have tons and tons of words under your belt. Lots of words, yeah. Well, I'm, I'm looking forward to that. And and you mentioned uh, expert panel, so let me just bring with you um, professor from Brandeis University, Professor Neil Swidey. Good afternoon, sir. Hey, Brian. How are you? Oh, very good. Glad to see you. Um, good to see you too. Where are you today? What what have we found in this perfectly placed room? Uh, I'm I'm just outside Boston. Very nice. Very nice. And you're enjoying autumn before the cold starts to set in. <laughs> yeah, I'm not. I'm dreading the clock changes. I'm one of those people who's been uh, oh, no. campaigning for the permanent uh, yeah. clock change because uh, I think there's no reason to to switch the clocks. We need as much daylight as we can in life. I agree. I agree. So so we want to stop falling back is what you're saying. I, right. No, I, okay. I can never remember. Is it daylight? Are we on daylight saving or are we going to daylight saving? I know there's... There's no S in daylight savings. That's about the only thing I remember. From. I just always abbreviate ET just to uh, you know just to take care of that. But listen, you heard my question to your colleague Stephen. What are, what are you going to be working on, Neil, for the next year? What are the big projects and the big ideas? Yeah, so I'm a lifelong journalist, and uh, about four years ago, I um, moved full time to um, Brandeis University, where I run the journalism program, and I'm and professor there. So uh, this has been a, a laboratory for me to figure out what we should and shouldn't be teaching about journalism in the 2020s. And so mm -hmm. I've been having a lot of fun 
with that and uh, uh, really reimagining um, what uh, are the essential skills to teach the next generation of either journalists or people who learn to think like a journalist but uh, uh, might be pursuing any other uh, number of careers. Mm, mm -hmm. Well, I'm, I'm glad to hear you say that. Um, just, just so you know, one of the cats that you haven't seen is named Hunter, as in Hunter S. Thompson. So nice. good, good journalism background right there. Love well, that. Yeah. Oh, hopefully, uh, uh, that cat uses fewer narcotics than uh, the <laughs> name. Cats do what they will. You know, the cats do what they will. Let, let me rearrange the screen here so that we're we're a bit more we're a bit more balanced, and we welcome both Neil and and Stephen. Uh, friends, if, if you're new to the forum, I'm going to ask our authors a couple of introductory guests so, to get the ball rolling. But then I want to step back and turn the floor over to all of you. We'd like to hear your questions, your comments, and your thoughts. And remember, at the bottom of the screen, we have those different options, the raised hand and the question mark. And of course, the chat box is already open and being used. So think about what you'd like to know from our two authors. Uh, and as they speak, um, I'm sure you'll have ideas. Uh, the, the first question I'd like to ask both of you is, you're very critical of enrollment management right now. And uh, you know, when I when I started looking at this, I I I was gonna expect it was a question about quantity that, you know, and total enrollment in American higher education has dropped for the past 12 years. Um, but instead you have an argument based more on on uh, ethics or or politics, arguing that enrollment management seems to penalize students uh, for coming from lower socioeconomic backgrounds or that it's not helping them with advancement. Can you can you flesh out that argument or that critique for me? Um, sure. Um, I mean, I just wanted to start off by saying that um, one of the most what I really wanted to look at in in this book is the actual industry that's uh, mm. there are enrollment managers who are on campuses. Um, and when we talk about enrollment management, we usually focus on them. Um, but what I was interested in was uh, the companies that, that are um, that sell the products and strategies that uh, colleges are using. And basically, the um, these products and strategies have been pushing colleges to uh, do two things. One, um, to uh, basically to recruit students and use financial aid in order to um, get the students that they will make them more prestigious. Um, so to help them raise up the rankings, um, this often are the best students who a college can get, uh, the best applicants that a college can attract, or the wealthiest. Um, so going up the rankings is one thing, but you get the wealthiest because the other big thing and probably the biggest thing that enrollment, the enrollment management industry pushes is to help colleges raise their revenue. Um, and I come from a background where I was covering federal student aid uh, for the Chronicle of Higher Education for a, a good long time. And the purpose of financial aid uh, from the government's point of view has been to um, increase access and to uh, provide need-based aid. Mm -hmm. And for um, several decades in the 50s, 60s, 70s, uh, colleges really were um, supplementing that. Um, they were helping, uh, and that was pre-enrollment management. Um, the private colleges uh, uh, sort of devoted themselves to providing need-based aid. Public universities basically were low cost, and so they were generally accessible. Um, come the uh, enrollment management, uh, and this enrollment management industry, uh, instead, what they, uh, the way that they use financial aid is to um, do a thing called financial aid leveraging. I mean, this is a, this is a long answer, so I don't know if, if it's, it's good. Long. It's good. But under financial aid leveraging, you're basically providing um, just enough. It, it's just enough of a discount, a discount off of the price 
to enroll certain groups of students and the biggest discounts go to get the students that the colleges want the most. Again, tends to be the best applicants or the wealthiest applicants who will help with rankings and revenue. And what that ends up, what ends up happening, uh, which I think is the big injustice, is that low-income students are left with large funding gaps, um, substantial funding mm -hmm. gaps, and they end up um, having gaps that are are so big that the only way that they can um, they can go to the school is is for their families to go very much into debt. And so we've seen huge growth in the plus loan program. Mm -hmm. um, I think part of the revenue strategies that some of these enrollment management companies are pushing actually are are encouraging colleges to steer low income students to plus loans, low income families to plus loans. Um, There was a study recently that Phil Levine from Wellesley University <laughs> did, and he found that for families making um, under 50000 the average net price that low-income families were being asked to pay was $18,000 at public universities mm. um, and 25000 at private colleges. Per year? yeah per year and you know those weren't my numbers i was actually i was actually surprised that they were it was that high but that's that's where i think um i think that um there are a number of practices that i object to in enrollment management but uh financial aid leveraging i think is one of the most hazardous wow i mean so yeah. so the, the the industry as you put it of, of enrollment management is actually contributing to worsening the student debt crisis Oh, uh, definitely. I mean, and I, th I think that that's just part and parcel. You have, uh, I'm just going to read you a quote um, from um, EAB, um, which is one of the largest enrollment, it's probably the largest enrollment management company now. Um, and the person who's in charge of their financial aid leveraging program uh, uh, said, um, uh, he said to, uh, he told Higher Ed Dive, the concept is to award financial aid in a way that results in the maximum total amount of net tuition revenue for the institution. So the purpose of financial aid is to raise revenue for the institution, which is totally, you know, foreign to what the original purpose of financial aid is. And one way to raise revenue for an institution is to load up people with plus loans. So anyway, so the, the, the key, the key goal there is not to recruit students of a certain character, not to elevate the reputation institution, not to uh, maximize a certain number, but specifically to maximize cash flow through revenue. To maximize cash flow, which, you know, the one of the reasons to focus on the firms themselves is they have such an outsized influence over the colleges, yet they don't they don't care about, I mean, they don't have any stake in the mission. Most colleges have a mission to help, you know, to um, to educate students, no matter, you know, what background they have. Um, but for a private company, um, a private consulting company, that's not really the most important uh, thing. And so, you know, it comes down to money. Um, and I should say EAB is owned by uh, private equity groups. But they're also trying to respond to their clients. Uh, if, if we're talking about the consulting firms um, that are are trying to maximize, you know, they're trying to maximize revenue for their own financial purposes, which could include financial crisis. For the, the colleges being in financial crisis. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. No, I'm not saying there aren't. I mean, basically, there there are so you know, and I think enrollment management started. Um, the industry originally was helping private colleges that were struggling. Um, uh, but I think over time, you see it uh, go from just those schools to the most selective schools, uh, or to a lot of the, not quite to the Harvards, but to the next level down. And, um, and then what I what I find most worrisome is that enrollment management has become a public university thing as well. And uh, and so these once low cost schools, uh, you know, which for generations uh, served as a gateway to the middle class, 
are now um, doing the same, using the same kind of strategies and tactics that um, private colleges do. Mm, mm, um, and um, I wanted to mention, so Neil, uh, I was very, very excited when uh, Neil agreed to uh, write uh, the first chapter of my book. Um, and he has a great chapter that talks about sort of the beginnings, uh, the, where enrollment management kind of started, what and sort of where it where it ended or where it's ended up and it's there was a pretty big change in um in it from its beginnings so i don't know if that's something that neil would want to talk about sure mm -hmm. neil yeah. I, was, I was going to make a bridge to you but uh but stephen built that bridge meticulously we're going to have to cross it now well, over to you sir what's what's your take on that yeah so as steve mentioned uh my goal here was to find uh, the origin story. Uh, and the origin story is, it's interesting. There's not um, just uh, uh, black hats and white hats in this and villains uh, and um, saints. Uh, I wanted to look at the beginning of this and I also wanted to look at uh, something that surprised me that people hadn't connected before, which was the growth of enrollment management and the parallel growth of US news rankings. Uh, they both started in the uh, 80s in, in reality and then really locked in uh, and became dominant in the 1990s at a time when uh, lots of other forces in higher education were reshaping the landscape. Remember the 1980s was a time of big um, disinvestment on the part of the federal government. Uh, mm -hmm first four years of the Reagan administration, mm -hmm. um, the, um, the cut in federal higher ed spending was about a billion dollars uh, just in the first uh, term of the Reagan years. So uh, that was changing a lot of things. And meanwhile, um, other things were, were happening. Uh, uh, debt went up, I would think about three times, uh, uh, tripled over 10 years. Uh, it was also the strange thing that was happening in the 80s with uh, post Vietnam, uh, college deferments had left. So fewer people were going and completing college at that time, at the same time that automation was hitting, uh, financial sector and a number of other industries. And, uh, so that the premium for someone who was, uh, had a college degree became, uh, much higher at a time that the supply was going down. So all these forces were happening. And remember, the 1980s was a time of uh, yuppie status as well, with everyone driving Volvos, but they also wanted those uh, elite college stickers on the back of those Volvos. So it was very interesting for me to go back and look at those things and look at how these two industries were really codependent and their growth uh, depended on uh, the other to happen. Uh, enrollment management began very innocently and very admirably, I think, uh, uh, for a long time, admissions offices had been run by former philosophy majors who had pencils and legal pads and had notions uh, about <laughs> the institution. Uh, and then the quant people started to come in. Uh, it was very easy beginning just people who know how to use spreadsheets and, and the like and figuring this out. And um, uh, a uh, um, chemistry professor at BC named Jack McGuire in the 70s was the first one to start doing early enrollment management. And he was uh, a STEM guy uh, who took over an admissions office at a time. It's hard to think about that now that Boston College is a dominant, very uh, uh, secure, financially secure with a big fat endowment uh, institution and high rankings, but in the 70s, it was hemorrhaging money and it, its future looked very uncertain. And so he was given the charge to figure out how to do this and how to promote retention as well. Again, good intentions of figuring out why are people not staying with our college uh, to graduation? Um, all colleges are doing that now, but in the 70s and 80s, people really weren't doing that and people were just drift in and drift out. So the kind of marketing approaches to figuring out, we should be surveying our people who are leaving to see what, how we fell down and how we can keep them there. All those good things kind of came out of, I think, enrollment management. Uh, they did use, as Steve said, the financial aid leveraging, which was 
you discount uh, a tuition, you often, often do it with an ego flattering presidential scholarship or merit scholarship. You call it something different. It's really a discount. Uh, but you do that so that more full pay people will come to your school. And the logic was sound initially. You, you did need more full pay people to come to your school so you could pay for low income students. And again, this is for institutions that don't have big endowments like the Ivies and the elite colleges. Um, these were colleges that were very tuition dependent and did not have big endowments. So they have realities. If you want to get promising low income students and all colleges do, uh, you, you have to fund that somehow. So if they could take uh, 10 or 15% off the top of the rack rate to get more with a scholarship uh, to get more students who could afford, whose families could afford to pay the full freight, that would afford the institution the ability to invite more um, full need students in. So those those were the beginnings of this. And likewise, the beginning of US news rankings, it's hard to think back to what US news was, but it was very interesting for me to go back to the beginning to see. Uh, US news, of course, was not the first ranking. There was a, you know, for more than a century now, there were rankings of college institutions. Uh, but US news quickly became one unlike any other and one that became a, a force that uh, demanded to be reckoned with uh, at every college campus. Uh, it was kind of preposterous, just uh, right out of the gate that you would have a college ranking every year. And it's still preposterous that there would be a meaningful change in higher ed, one of the industries most allergic to change and rapid change for sure, uh, that there would be appreciable differences in any institution from year to year uh, that would make someone go from number six to number 16. It's preposterous, right? Uh, it was a beauty contest when it began, uh, just a population reputational survey with back scratching and log rolling that was happening in there. Uh, but there was a very uh, a savvy uh, former Newsweek editor who came and took over US News, the special projects portfolio in the 80s. Uh, at the time when U.S. News was the the sickliest of the uh, news weeklies, and saw this as a profit center and a way to get buzz for for the the publication, particularly in the chattering classes of of the kind of elite corners where people were concerned about um, where their kids went to school. And so he figured that out. This Mel Elfin, um, very creative and and. Uh, kind of a marketing pro himself and changed it from an every other year survey to an every year survey published, turned it into a book that was then published and put on the newsstands, became a big source of revenue for this um, uh, news weekly and became something that every college president, every board of trustees focused on and, uh, and people then looked at there became new pressure for those rankings to get better, or at least more defensible. So that was a focus more on metrics, actual metrics that you could compare one from another. And I will say prior to the US news rankings, uh, the universities were all just reputational. Uh, no one really had any idea. Um, and so it wasn't necessarily a bad thing to get people, particularly as those prices started going up because of that federal disinvestment people wanted a better sense of what they were shelling out tens of thousands of dollars for. Um, and, you know, there's a, uh, this idea in marketing that if you're marketing something very specific, like a car, you want to market in a way that's very um, general, um, that gives you notions about a good car, uh, what it would be. If you're marketing something very um, general, like a college education, you want to make it more specific. Uh, and that's this obsession with metrics. And so those things started to feed each other. And they saw, the institution saw that if they moved up on the US news rankings, a lot of their problems seemed to go away because they had higher, uh, they had more uh, leverage and more to play with, with the people coming in. I will mention this just as a reminder, I was just looking at this again. 
think about what the admit rates are for the top colleges right now in the country. Um, they're three and four percent, maybe to the acceptance rate for that. Now imagine um, 1991 when the rankings were just beginning. Take a guess, Brian, what the um, acceptance rate was at the University of Pennsylvania, Ivy League school. Uh, 1991, uh, say 15%? 47%. So wow. one out of every two applicants to UPenn, 1991 get it. Now, University of Chicago has like a 4%, 5% admin rate today. Guess what it was in 1996? Uh, I'm going to say half. 71%. So three <laughs> out of every four applicants to the University of Chicago. Um, wow. So this was the world. This was the landscape. Uh, before all these pressures came in. But of course, when you got a lot more students applying to college, particularly with the Common App, it made it very easy. Uh, uh, admit rates um, started to, to go up, but also colleges had more trouble discerning who was actually genuinely interested. Mm. When you're applying to four schools, you can get a sense, as, as students on average were when I was applying to college, four or five schools, uh, you get a sense that you've got a good shot if you let them in that they're coming to your school. If school, if students are applying to 20 colleges, as they are now, mm -hmm. um, you have no idea if they're coming. And so enrollment management then became a tool that people used uh, to try to discern interest and to figure out what will it take to get the student to say yes, because it wasn't just the admit, it was this dance of, we're gonna admit you, but we don't, it was like middle school dating. You wanna make sure when you <laughs> ask, that they're gonna say yes. Um, and so that became th these issues. And particularly again, the schools that are most constrained and most tuition dependent and have the smallest endowments, they're most in need for this idea of, of, of something to grapple with and enrollment management filled that void for them. Uh, that is the origin story for this. We can, we'll talk more about kind of how that got perverted. And I, and I interviewed a number of people who were there at the creation early on mm -hmm. who have come to really um, regret what happened with enrollment management and these tactics uh, and kind of um, feel really sad about some of these things, the unintended consequences of what started out uh, in a good way. I think no one's really ever was from the beginning i think the u.s news rankings were dubious from the start but their reality that nobody can deny college presidents get promoted or fired because based on their u.s news rankings there's no denying that uh so uh that's just a reality that that is still with us today but yeah, that no, no. is the interesting thing of these two industries that became a parallel freight trains on parallel tracks that mm. merged at some point along the way and have really reshaped the landscape we all live with. Yeah, because the uh, the U.S. news rankings and the metrics that they chose became sort of the blueprint for enrollment management. And so these companies mm. that came in suddenly um, became very useful to for colleges that are looking to uh, go up the rankings. And so it sort of gave them the purpose that uh, they needed to really build into the juggernaut that enrollment, the enrollment management industry has become. Oh, that's yeah, I, I compare it in the book to the sabermetrics in baseball. Mm -hmm. When Billy Bean was the only one doing um, sabermetrics, uh, they had a real competitive advantage. You had a small market team that was getting into the playoffs uh, and outperforming everyone else. But as soon as everyone else started doing sabermetrics, uh, your competitive advantage is gone and it morphs into something different and it becomes a little bit of a Frankenstein that you cannot control. Which is why we need a pitch clock in enrollment management. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've heard this um, echoed in the, uh, I think it was the early 2000s, someone saying that uh, IT doesn't make a difference because everybody has the same basic computing power. Um, and so, you know, it, there's no longer a competitive differential for this. I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated by this history. Uh, Neil yeah, and uh, and Stephen, how this plugs in, where we have the ranking metrics, and then we have enrollment management, uh, and that seems to lead to stratification. So the uh, universities want to have more and more elite students, so they increase their, or rather, they decrease their acceptance rate. Um, how does this 
Does this reflect the larger macroeconomic trend of increasing wealth and income inequality that kicked off around 1980 as well? Yeah, no, I mean, I think it's it's part and parcel. Um, I mean, in part, the Reagan, uh, uh, when the Reagan administration came in and they basically said that higher education was a private good rather than a public good, yeah. and they... Um, uh, cut federal student aid, um, and, uh, and and that's when the, the loan program became the primary way that of uh, the primary means of financing uh, uh, for college, the primary primary federal means of financing. Um, it's all it's all tied it's all tied in. So the colleges that sort of let the colleges sort of uh, you know that sort of let them loose. <laughs> to try to find alternatives and to uh, be more entrepreneurial. I mean, it is really in the late 80s or so when I was going to college, when private colleges basically realized that they were underpriced and that they started raising their prices um, uh, by very large percentages. And I, I remember when I was in college, I mean, I may be wrong about this, but I really feel like there were like 30% increases in tuition while I was there year to year. So it, right. that, but I may be wrong. That was, but, but I do know that, you know, those late eighties was when the private colleges really like reset and, and, um, and that's, and that's the beginning of using your financial aid uh, in ways uh, to not, you know, not meeting need. Um, and so I think, I think there's been, what's amazing to me about all of this is that there has been like a real transformation in the way that colleges recruit and the way that colleges use their financial aid. And yet very, very, very few people know, have ever heard of enrollment management, have ever heard of the enrollment management industry even when i try to tell anyone about the book <laughs> they're like mm -hmm. okay what is that um and um and this isn't just you know it's not just regular people or whatever i i find some people in higher ed don't really know much about it yeah. and policymakers there's no uh there it it's kind of fascinating there hasn't been a single congressional hearing where enrollment management has really been discussed mm. um you know if 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 the higher ed people on the hill know anything about eab i'd be surprised mm. you know it just isn't um so the first thing i would like is there to at least uh, be some acknowledgement that there is this industry and it's leading to these incentives um, and really undermining the federal mission, in, uh, which has been since 1965, to increase access in higher ed. Well, I'm glad, the, I'm glad that your book uh, is out there now. And I, I hope our discussion today and the subsequent YouTube presence can help for that mission. Uh, friends, I, I have more questions I want to ask, but I'd really like to hear from all of you. And, and we have a couple of questions in the pipeline. So Stephen and Neil, I'm, I'm going to share the first of these, which is actually a, a text question. Uh, and this comes from our good friend of ours in the central Mediterranean, Phil Lingard, and he asks, to what extent is approved prior qu equivalent learning admissions being used in the U.S. to promote lifelong learning? I'm not sure. I have to say, I'm not. I don't know that I can answer this question. I don't know exactly what private. Can you put the question back up? Sure. Um, yeah. I, and uh, I'm uh, not sure I know what private equivalent learning admissions is. Um, you don't need of you. Yeah, I, I, that's that's. Um, I, I assume that it, equivalent learning admissions is that. Um, yeah. uh, building blocks of education or life experience that you've had that then can be used for to qualify for admissions. Yeah, Philip, if, if you could in the chat or if you want to uh, raise your hand or enter another question, just just to unfold it a bit. My my intuition is that it refers to competency based education. Yeah, competency competency <laughs> basis. I don't believe it's used very much. I know that there has been some growth in interest in competency based learning, but, but let's, let's it, make sure that... it's selective college admissions. It's it's cool. not a We'll, we'll circle. We'll circle back to that one uh, when we hear back from Philip. We have another question coming from uh, Minnesota from our good friend Fritz Vandover, 
and he wants to join us on stage. So let me make some room for him right now. Hello, Fritz. Can you hear me okay? Loud and clear. Okay. So that question, previous question was about credit for prior learning. And was it Phil or Philip? Brian? Phil, yes. It's a it's maddeningly variable right now. Uh, there's no standard, so it, every state is figuring it out on their own, and it's messy. So I'll say that for that. Um, I just want to make a couple observations. Um, first of all, you're bringing up a very important uh, part of higher ed right now with enrollment management. Um, one thing I find maddening is that while the companies you know they're like anything there's good players and dubious players etc there's where's the accountability on institutions to me any financial aid office that packages loans for an undergraduate student that would exceed the at, you know the average loan balance for a graduate you know in the last couple of years yeah. there's no accountability on that right. so these institutions, and I've worked on Harrod for 20 plus years. I've been in small institutions, small private ones, like the one you're talking, ones you're talking about, all the way higher level liberal arts college here in St. Paul. And I've been at the University of Minnesota and I've been in Washington University. These institutions accept this help. They, they seek it out. So I'm not saying they're all bad players, but there needs to be an accountability down at that level. So to just say the companies are the bad actors and they're the problem is it, it's more nuanced than that. Oh yeah, I, I I would say like just to say like I don't mean to to uh, I don't mean to um, excuse the colleges and in fact the solutions that we're talking about would in the book um, would actually be we're trying to change the incentive structure for the mm -hmm. colleges themselves. There would be some some would penalize the colleges, so I'm not trying to excuse them. What I'm tr trying to do though is if you if i found this from experience if you criticize enrollment managers on campuses you end up uh with a lot of feedback that like well we you know we're just you know we're just part of this you know that we get our marching orders from the presidents and the boards and you know we're um you know we uh and i i think and i think that 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 is you know, true up to extent, there are some very powerful campus enrollment managers who have mm -hmm. more um, sway. But I think basically what's happened is that there is just been a mind, an enrollment management mindset that has seeped in over the last four decades over higher ed, where the rankings um, and revenue are like the most important factors. And so, yeah, so I'm not trying to say that colleges, and if you read- Oh, the no, book, no, 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 I- I trying to say that, they, I wouldn't say just penalize but I, But having been in, in my, my doctorate's in higher ed policy, so I, you know, I'm, I'm with you on all this, but I would say, be careful about over amplifying the reality of rankings for most institutions of the 4,000 mm -hmm. plus Title IV eligible institutions. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Most, they worried about keeping the lights on yeah yeah rather than where are we in us news most institutions yeah. like the ivies they don't exist in a way because they're they have money that no institution most yeah. institutions can't even even imagine right so they yeah they're chasing their tails all of that but to say that every institution aspires to be harvard is really not the reality at this level because enrollment management it, there's the there's no coincidence between the 1980s when funding started to shift yeah, yeah, under yeah. deregulation. I mean, Reagan really started this in the 60s, late 60s when he was governor of California. He started yeah. dismantling that whole public good, you know, well-funded, affordable University of California model. So it's no coincidence between flattening of or a decrease in public support, um, flattening of wage growth for most Americans, changes in demographics. We start getting the baby boom push into higher ed is starting to level off and plane down. There's, there's no surprise that enrollment yeah, yeah. starts to be a reality. Like, crap, we need to do this now. Um, and it's, you know, it's accelerating more. Can I just say one thing, though? Um, you, I, you're right about US News in the beginning. It was a beauty contest for elite schools. And in fact, there's, there's ample evidence that um, early on, the 
the editors um, cooked the books, but when when their own algorithms produced Caltech as a top school, and they said there can't be the top school if it's not Yale, Harvard, or Princeton, and mm. they went back and did that, and that was actually exposed. Uh -huh. um, in the beginning, that's what it was. But as they wanted to expand too, and as schools wanted to do this, those rankings are, are um, there are numbers, there are so many different categories now. And every if you go to every non-selective college in the country now uh, that is ranked on US News in one category or another, it is on the banner flying as you drive into the campus. And mm -hmm. that's true of colleges that I reported on mm -hmm. that went out of business. And I reported on them when they were about to go out of business and they had US News rankings yeah. on there because they were, you know, there's, Oh, it became almost a comedy of some of the, the copycat pay to play um, rankings and other ones like the Princeton Review gave out the best uh, fire safety. Uh, that was a ranking for a college ranking. And, and that's and, and that's on Princeton Review ranked uh, on the campus of the college that made the top of that list. They also, um, again, uh, when James Fallows took over U.S. News, a very uh, honorable editor who had been a critic of the US news rankings and wanted to get rid of them and realized they couldn't because it would decimate all the funding for the newsroom that they were doing serious journalism for. He tried to make them better. And one of the things they did, which again was good to separate public and private institutions. So you weren't comparing them together and separate out liberal arts schools from universities. Uh, but that became an arms race for flagship universities, and they use merit aid, as, as T's pointed out, as, as much as anybody now poaching. Um, UVM has more students from the University of Vermont, uh, mm -hmm. from Massachusetts, than it does from, from Vermont. Yeah. Uh, Dane as well, too, because they found how to use the discounting to get them in there. So everyone is is trying to compete in this world, and, and I agree with you completely that it, the accountability falls with the people who are hiring the consultants, uh, mm -hmm. people who are making those decisions. And again, I start with this point, too, and Steve and I um, have debated this before. I don't think enrollment management is inherently bad. I think it can make um, decisions and trade-offs clearer. So you make those decisions. We want to have more low-income young women in STEM. Here's what it'll take to get more competitive who have lots of other choices to get them into our college. We can do this here or this. Um, it's how you use it. And, and I think... It, the evidence is pretty uh, clear now that most institutions are using it um, in a way that is focused on the revenue rather than the mission. And I think that's that's where things have, have gotten out of whack. Revenues. I don't know about the widespread use of tuition discounting in public institutions. It's still mostly a low tuition, low aid. Now, low being relative, you know, the University of Minnesota is not cheap, but there are scholarships, but this is an example. By and large, undergraduate tuition is not discounted like, say, a regional private or a, a private institution like one local aid. It's still mostly low tuition, low aid. The variance is when you get into it's out of state. Out of state, state. Out yes. Of oh yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. State. That that is that's but that's I, where it's I, happening. I, I UMass is taking all these. University yeah. of Massachusetts is taking all these kids sure. from New York. But I don't think it's low tuition, low aid as much anymore. I think it depends for in-state students, I yes. Think for out of state, it's, it's not it's even small. for in, not even for in-state. I'm looking at the um, the Phil Levine uh, analysis, mm -hmm. and he was only looking at in-state students, and he found that. Did you post the, a link to that? I'm, I'm interested to read it. Yeah, uh, the average net price for low-income students was eighteen thousand um, dollars. So I think it really depends on the state. I think it does are states, very much. There are states that are still that. But what I'm worried about is that um, is that enrollment management is encouraging colleges to go the opposite way to high aid, high tuition. Discount. Did you factor in those st play, those state institution systems that are discounting with ones that have seen the most precipitous drop in state aid? Because I bet you'll see a big, strong relationship. Yeah, and, and this is from Phil Levine's uh, research, not mine. I think you're right, Fritz. I think that's it became a oh, survival sure. strategy when you have um, disinvestment at the, or the other thing we should say is it's not just disinvestments in spending. Um, the price of higher ed has 
you know, I, the last time I looked at this was about 10 years ago, but if, if the rate of inflation had continued and the price of cost of attendance from 1974 to, to 2016, I think when I looked at this, um, the, the total cost of attendance at Harvard uh, would have been uh, um, uh, 44th, uh, sorry. Yeah, it's been far out of whack for yeah. as long, but for, for all these perverse reasons, like yeah. right. income distribution and and do demographics, the last thing I'll say, and then Brian, I will shut up. Um, no. Oh gosh, it was right on the tip of my tongue too. Okay. Uh, Administrative hiring too has been a big issue um, at universities, and that's something there's there's good data about that, and that's th those are factors that are happening that probably all of you know as well too. It used to be faculty governance was actually happening on the campuses uh, right. and at faculty, the incentive structure for faculty, I can say this now, is more for in your field off campus, mm -hmm. um, the, the incentive to be more involved in managing this, the, the campus itself became fell to more administrative hiring and federal mandates. Oh yeah, the ratio of staff to faculty. I mean, faculty wage growth has not been crazy That's over not the last the issue. 50, no. 60 years. Yeah. It's been all the layers on top of it that just didn't exist yeah. before, yes. say, the 1980s. Absolutely. Hmm. Completely. Uh, one, I, one last I, thing added I, would the, I added the fill of the evening. Thank you. One last thing I'll mention, too, which, again, when you go back to the history, you remind um, one of the changes, and this happens with particularly flagship universities, uh, uh, state flagship universities, uh, was uh, the deregulation of airlines and mm -hmm and telecom mm -hmm. that collapsed the idea of where was too far to go to school because remember you know when i was in school mm -hmm. my parents mm -hmm. would say hang up this is this is long distance right, right, right. Uh, that changed that and certainly cheap airlines changed that as well so all these forces are out there doing that at the same time that you have what you're saying fritz about that the, the these demographic shifts and the, the cutbacks and shifts so that that created where we are now interesting to see uh, the infrastructure of globalization playing a role in this change. Oh, yeah. uh, Fritz, thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, um, please uh, stay warm over the next few months. <laughs> I don't think we're having a problem this winter, Brian. Yeah. So we'll stay brown and mild. So thanks, guys, for, <laughs> for yeah. the chat. Take thank care. You. Fritz. Um, friends, we're, we're coming close to the end of the hour somehow. We're racing ahead. And we have another question from our, our dear friend and once upon a time guest, uh, Tom Hames. Uh, and this is uh, a question which, uh, Stephen, you'll appreciate this, refers to a place you used to work. Uh, Tom says, there was an article in the Chronicle of Higher Ed this week that discussed people cheating, quote unquote, with AI in enrollment. Do you see AI as a leveler in equity in enrollment management? Uh, I don't, I, I was actually at the uh, NACAC conference um, recently and I saw it, which is the uh, admissions uh, uh the main admissions group um, and uh, all of the companies, the enrollment management companies are all looking at how to use um, AI. So I don't, I figure, I figure if they're all, if EAB is working with about um, AI, that it'll just be another tool um, in their toolbox at some point, but I, I'm not enough of an expert on AI to know how it could be a leveler or um, whether it will. Hmm. Um, Neil, do you want to take a whack at that? No, I, I, well, the only thing I would add is that um, we just had uh, on campus this week, we had uh, David McCraw, who's the top uh, brilliant media lawyer and the top lawyer newsroom lawyer for the New York Times. Hmm. The New York Times is suing OpenAI right now, as many of you know, um, mm -hmm. in a case that I think is going to really have enormous ramifications for the quality of AI coming out and what happens uh, on that. And he was just reminding our students uh, uh, that AI that we're dealing with now is the worst AI we're ever going to be dealing with. So any of the, the massive failures in AI right now um, uh, are going to get uh, worked out. Uh, so I think the big moral questions uh, are not going to get worked out. The te technologists are about improving their apps and improving their technology. And I think we've uh, all paid a price in society by 
assuming that the technologists are going to be uh, wrestling with the ethical and moral decisions. Um, I don't think their incentive structure is set up for that. So I think we have to do that and figure right. it out. Who, I mean, who's, I'm, 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 I'm sorry, but who's the we in this case? I mean, I, so I'll speak from 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 journalists uh, and mm -hmm. where we for about 10 years in the media world, the, the top newsroom uh, executives were so scared about how technology was going to change their business model and change their competitive uh, abilities um, that they deferred to Silicon Valley to make decisions um, that Silicon Valley had no um, wherewithal to make, no standing to make. Uh, and we're paying the price for that now. We've we've learned that lesson in journalism that oh, we have to be there um, to make those decisions. Uh, and people who uh, have the grounding uh, about the implications of um, our democracy and our um, inform citizenry and our journalistic operations uh, that we have to be in those rooms making those decisions. So I can't speak for other industries, but I can speak for the mistakes that our industry made that we as a whole population are, are paying the price for. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry, Stephen, you started to say. No, no, that's okay. I was just going to say I'm a total Luddite and um, I watch Battlestar Galactica. So I'm, I am I just feel like AI is going to come in and destroy us all. So, so you, you want the uh, Adama protocol implemented. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, on, on that on that lovely geeky note, uh, Tom wanted to uh, follow up. Uh, okay, let, sorry. Me, let me bring him on stage. Um, are you human yeah. Cylon, Tom? We need to check. No, uh, I am a bot, uh, but uh, not a Cylon. <laughs> Um, no, I, the, the question I had was, I mean, the article that I, that I saw in the Chronicle this morning was around uh, students using AI to write application letters and other sorts of things. I mean, here's the thing. In order to get into a lot of these schools when it comes to, quote unquote, enrollment management, there's a pre-filter because there's a whole population of students who can't afford the thousands of dollars of test prep and uh, uh, advising and financial aid. Here's how you get this scholarship and all that sort of thing. I see AI as a potential leveler in that, in that you're giving tools to people to use uh, who wouldn't otherwise have access to them. And of course, the problem I have, and of course the problem that, the, well, the problem I have with the way that the, the institutions are reacting is they somehow see this as cheating. And um, that is inequitable. It's that, you know, those students are pre-excluded from systems where they have to go through a lot of rigmarole to the more elite schools um, and, in order to get in in the first place. And, and we know there's a whole game involved in that. And so I see this from both sides. I you know, teach at a prep school as well as at a college level. And so I see both sides of this equation. And the kids here have a lot of advantages when it comes to that. But the kids who end up in the community college had none of those advantages. And they're at a community college because they could navigate the not insignificant hurdles to get in there either, but those are more bureaucratic than anything. Um, but to me, I see AI as being a very powerful tool for students to be able to help them write application letters the right way to help them figure out which are the right combinations of schools I should be applying for, all of those sorts of things. It empowers the students in a way that you used to have to pay consultants for. And that's where I see the real threat. Uh, if, you're, if you're a consultant who is an admissions consultant, I see that as, a, that as a, a position that could be under threat by this sort of thing. I was just wondering if that, because yeah. the, the talk is about equity and, and, and enrollment management, but we have to recognize that there are a lot of things that are going on before you ever get an application. You're never gonna get an application from some of these kids. They yeah. can't yeah. afford it. Tom, I think that's a great point. And so, one of the things I worked with some friends um, about 15 years ago to start a nonprofit in Boston that works exclusively with low income, mostly first gen students who started college, mm -hmm. didn't complete it, had a setback and need to go back. And there was no apparatus for that. And that's most low income. All other universal yeah. problems, yes. Um, so I'm very attuned to the idea of of institutions and how they overlook those students and how it takes work to do that and, and why the the richest colleges in this country don't do nearly enough. Um, and they all look for um, 
uh, they don't, no one wants to go out on a limb. And so that's why even for um, students of color, um, low income students of color at Ivy League schools, almost more than half of that, and in some cases, three quarters of those students at Princeton, mm -hmm. at Harvard, they went to private schools. Mm -hmm. They were scholarship students at private. Why is that? Because those schools don't really want to take chances. They want someone to have been packaged through a prep school because um, they don't want the variability of a public school where an English lit class might not be the English lit class that they're used to. They're, mm -hmm. they're, they're failing in their mission which should be to be working hard to find the right students and not being obsessed with their benchmarking. Harvard doesn't worry about falling out of the US News top 10, but they do worry about Princeton and Yale being above them because they actually care about that. Uh, and that's the, the distortion effect that this hyper focus on metrics has had at every level. So Harvard, it's true what, what Fritz said before, it's different for schools that are non-selective schools. Uh, but they have their own hyper focus with their benchmark and who they compare themselves against and and the other schools the schools who have the 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 most uh abundant resources should be doing a lot more to find the kind of students that i'm working with in the nonprofit to get them there and it drives me nuts that they don't because they they're so risk averse um, because they want to protect their standing for there so i agree with you there should be different ways of, of leveling that i'm not there with you yet that 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 um, that the AI is going to be doing it because I know how these colleges are working and they're looking at what, what high school you went to and they're making their decisions before they even see the letter. Um, so I don't think it's the application letter. I think it's other okay. things. Yeah. That All right. Well, yeah. that is inherently discriminatory. I mean, that's yeah. like, that is, it's that true, is getting why, why it's are more than yeah. half of the students of color at Princeton, um, low income students of color have gone to a private college when less than, Five percent or seven percent go to a private college, a private right. High school. But we we have situations. I mean, we have uh, de facto segregation here in Texas because of the five percent rule or seven percent rule that UT and A and M have. And it, what happens there is, of course, if you are going to a very affluent school where you're busting the curve, so to speak, you're going to have a hard time getting into that that top tier. So you actually have situations where where people who are going to affluent schools are transferring to yeah. less affluent schools because they'll look better in Actually, a percentage. That's not, that's not a bad thing, though, because well, uh, it it's not it necessarily isn't. a bad thing if you spread people around a little bit. It's like busting. <laughs> but it, but it, it depends. The system it, depends on inequity in schools, in a sense. Right. Right. And no, it's, no, it's, it's basically taking segregation and the legacies of right, right. Jim Crow. It's factoring that into the admissions process. So, I think it's, so we still I haven't think, gotten rid of that. Well, I yeah. think it's sort of saying this is probably going to be the reality, you know, but yeah. I agree. I, I, this seems like a, a grim note to end on. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I want to try and pull this out. I, I do want to thank you, Tom. Uh, as thank usual, you. You reliably ask deep and powerful questions. I thank you. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it, this brings us back again to, uh, to history, though. Uh, when Tom is speaking of the history of segregation, de jure and de facto, for me, this echoes, Neil, um, your discussion of, of the changes that occurred uh, with uh, private equity and, uh, and the, uh, the go-go neoliberal economics of the 1980s, along with the rise of U.S. News and World Report, and, and Stephen, of course, with the Reagan Revolution and the defunding that begins from there. Um, what, what you've described so so beautifully and carefully is this transformed uh, enrollment industry, which now has a powerful and in some cases very negative impact on higher education. I, we have so much more to say, but we are out of time. Let me refer everybody to the uh, to the book itself. You can find a link to Lifting the Veil and Enrollment Management on the bottom left of our screen. We have a 20%, off, I think 20% off uh, uh, discount code, yeah, which, uh, which so thank you to the publisher for that. Uh, let me ask both of you, uh, starting with uh, Stephen, what's the best way to keep up with you and your work, you know, the, the successor volume and all that? Um, so uh, the best way, I, I do a lot on LinkedIn. I, I, uh, I, should, have, I should have had this uh, ready. Um, hold That's on. Right. Um, I, don't even, I don't even know what my, my handle is, though. Let's see. Well, it's either a string of numbers or it's something like uh, Stephen J. Bird. But uh, yeah, just look me up, Stephen Bird, B-U-R-D, on LinkedIn. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And we'll definitely keep an eye on you there. Um, and uh, Neil, how do we keep up with you? 
I just put it in the the chat, neilsweaty.com or at Neil Sweaty. Um, Excellent. Excellent. Uh, thank you. Thank you both. This is this is terrific, essential research, I think, for everybody in higher education to partake of. Thank you both for the research and for spending the past hour with us. Thank you so much. OK, well, thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks for having us and great questions, everyone. Yeah. Thank you, indeed. Yeah. Well, don't go away yet, friends. Uh, I need to uh, just point out where we're headed in the next few weeks. Um, and I, I just want to second uh, Neil's praise. Those are great questions. As always, the forum is a great place for conversation about the future of higher education. If you want to keep talking about this, enroll in management, everything from its historical framework to the staffing issues and so on, just hit us up in the social media world. Uh, to hear all of my accounts on Twitter, LinkedIn, Mastodon, Threads, Blue Sky. Use the hashtag FTTE if you want to uh, get, you know, drag my attention into this. If you'd like to look into our previous sessions where we talk about topics around enrollment management, you can go to our archive at tinyurl.com slash FTF archive. If you want to look ahead to other topics, we're going to be addressing how to change grading for the better, what the future of workforce might look like, and still more. Go to forum.futureofeducation.us. Thank you again for all the excellent questions. Uh, thank you for the great conversation. I hope everyone is doing well as we settle into October. For those of you in the Northern Hemisphere, I hope you get to enjoy autumn and prepare for the coolness to come. Take care, everybody. We'll see you next time online. Bye-bye.